Let's talk about lithium batteries. These things are quickly becoming one of the most important resources in the world. We need a lot of batteries to achieve a successful transition to sustainable energy. But lithium batteries are also very expensive. They are hard to make and obtaining the raw materials can be an extremely messy process. Batteries might be the key to sustainable energy, but can we actually make sustainable batteries? There are many different kinds of batteries that are being used to power the modern world, but the one thing that almost all of them will have in common is the element known as lithium. Here is an oversimplified explanation for why that is. The lightest element on the periodic table is hydrogen. It's one proton orbited by one electron, and hydrogen is an extremely reactive element, which means that it is very happy to mingle with other protons and electrons and will freely release electrons into the world. This is good because free-flowing electrons create electricity. The downside to hydrogen atoms is that they have a fairly low energy potential, so when those electrons are released, their electrical flow doesn't carry that much energy, it's low voltage. The second lightest element on the periodic table is helium. That's two protons with two electrons, but helium is non-reactive, so it will not give up those electrons under any reasonable circumstances. The third lightest element is lithium. Now we have three protons in one atomic core with an inner orbit of two electrons plus a third electron in an outer orbit. Just like hydrogen, lithium is a highly reactive element. It will happily give up its outermost electron to support the flow of electricity, and unlike hydrogen, lithium has a high energy potential. The voltage generated by releasing a lithium electron is three times that of hydrogen. And that's why we use lithium in batteries. It's extremely light and reactive, with a very high energy potential. Plus, lithium is fairly common on Earth, so we can source a lot of it. But hold up a minute. If lithium is so common, then why is it so expensive? And why do we have all of these supply issues? Didn't Elon Musk overthrow the government of Bolivia just to get their lithium mines? It's complicated. I mean, Elon probably didn't coup Evo Morales and the Bolivian government. He just made a stupid joke about it on Twitter. And as Elon later pointed out, Tesla gets all of their lithium from Australia anyway. He probably should have led with that one. But something that Elon Musk definitely does support is the idea that lithium is not scarce, and that the real limiting factor for battery production is the refining of raw lithium into battery-grade material. Elon doesn't think that mining lithium should be a concern, but he might not be 100% correct on that. So, lithium mining is a relatively small industry in the scale of global resource extraction. In the year 2021, we mined about 106,000 tons of raw lithium, which is very small compared to some other common metals that we would find inside of a battery cell. For example, we mined 2.7 million tons of nickel, 20 million tons of manganese, 68 million tons of aluminum, and 2.6 billion tons of iron ore was extracted in the same year. And the question is not so much about how much lithium we extract right now, the problem is whether the amount can be scaled up over time to meet the future demand. And if lithium batteries are an essential part of a global energy transition, then obviously there is going to be significant demand. It's typically much more difficult to scale up a small operation than a large one, so it's questionable as to whether these existing lithium miners can just seamlessly raise their output to keep up with demand. Mining is a very slow-moving process that shouldn't be very surprising. You can't just pick a spot and start digging. It takes between four and seven years between the initial surveying phase and the output of material. Everything begins with exploratory drilling for core samples. You have to know exactly what is in the ground before you start to make any big moves. That's followed up by sample analysis then high-definition mapping of the lithium deposit, then research and development for the specific methodology of extraction that will best fit your particular mining operation, then a viable study, environmental planning, then design and manufacture of your own mining infrastructure. 
And then once a mine is established, you have a finite amount of resources in the location, and you make a plan to extract that material over a set period of time. The faster you extract the resources, the higher your operating cost will be. So it's not in the best interest of the miner to move quickly, and they are definitely not going to be easily convinced to accelerate that timeline once it has begun. But it's the refining process that Elon Musk and Tesla are putting their energy towards. They've begun construction of Tesla's first lithium refinery near Corpus Christi, Texas. This makes a lot more sense from a business perspective, as a refinery can be brought online in just two or three years, and you don't have to worry about digging holes in the ground. Now, that's not to say that refining lithium is easy either. The stuff that we dig up out of the ground is a mineral called spodumene, which contains the raw lithium element, so we need to process that spodumene and convert it into either lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. Lithium carbonate is widely used to treat people with bipolar disorder. When ingested, it can act to stabilize a person's brain chemistry and smooth out the imbalances that cause manic depressive episodes. Lithium carbonate can also be used to make batteries, which I find very fascinating. Anyway, lithium carbonate is a relatively low level of refinement that basically just involves a lot of water, and therefore it's only really suitable for low energy density battery cells like the LFP chemistry used in Tesla's standard range Model 3. To create a high performance nickel based cell, you need lithium hydroxide. This requires an additional chemical process to further refine the lithium carbonate into a more effective battery material. This is what Tesla will be producing at their Texas refinery. They're aiming to create enough lithium hydroxide to support 1 million electric vehicles per year. As it stands right now, our global demand for lithium is rising 40% per year. And according to some very legitimate projections, that means that the demand for refined lithium hydroxide is going to exceed the supply beginning around 2027 or 2028 unless something changes. But like we identified earlier, lithium progress moves very slowly, so that change needs to be happening right now if it's going to arrive in time. Most of the world's lithium is held in South America, particularly Chile and Argentina, and yes, also Bolivia, but let's not get hung up on that again. The problem is that this lithium is much harder to obtain than it is in a location like Australia. Instead of spodumene mineral being buried underground, the lithium in South America is held in these big desert salt flats, and the process to extract the lithium involves flooding out massive swaths of land, then evaporating the water away to reveal the lithium carbonate. This evaporation process can take years to separate the lithium, and it requires countries like Chile to use up massive amounts of water, draining rivers and wetlands and contributing to the scarcity of fresh water in the country. This has already led to small indigenous communities losing access to natural water, leaving them reliant on tanker trucks to deliver their drinking water. It's a problem that the government of Chile is trying to balance. The lithium trade is good for their economy, but bad for their people and natural environment. Chile is currently working on a national lithium strategy that will aim to make this industry sustainable. Another source of potential growth in lithium supply is the continent of Africa. It contains a lot of spodumene mineral, the same as Australia, but there is so much instability among the nations of Africa, governments are fragile, war is frequent, and as we've already seen with cobalt mining, the human cost of extracting these resources can be absolutely horrible when there is no strict regulation in place. Or what if we didn't need lithium at all? This is where things get a little complicated, because like we discussed at the beginning, there is no better element in the known universe for making batteries than lithium. But what about second best? Sodium ion batteries are an emerging technology that can solve a lot of our current problems. Sodium is down at number 11 on the periodic table. That means it's much heavier and more complex with 11 protons orbited by 11 electrons, about three times the atomic weight of lithium. But sodium is reactive, and it offers a reasonable amount of potential energy. It's also a lot easier to come by. The ocean is full of it. We all have salt in our house. We literally need it to live. And you can make batteries with sodium, kinda. 
The technology does work, but engineers are struggling to achieve anything near the energy density and cycle life that comes with a lithium battery. And when we're talking about industrial battery applications like electric cars and grid-scale energy storage, we can't really afford to give up that high level of performance. Not yet, at least. The upshot here is that our electrical systems continue to get more and more efficient as we go. This is particularly true with electric vehicles. We used to think that iron-based LFP batteries could not possibly offer enough energy density to power an EV, but Tesla was able to make the electrical architecture of their Model 3 so efficient that it can run just fine on an LFP battery pack. It's not as much range or performance as a nickel-based battery, but LFP is good enough. And we could maybe reach that same point with a sodium battery chemistry. It may never fully replace lithium batteries, but as we progress towards higher efficiencies and lower power consumption, sodium ion will probably be considered good enough for a pretty wide range of applications. And by continuing to diversify our options for battery materials, then it starts to feel a lot more possible that we can actually reach a point where we have all of the batteries we need with sustainable production and reasonable prices. And at that point, the transition to sustainable energy will be inevitable. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That is so important for getting our content out to more people. If you enjoy the content, then you'd probably also enjoy our weekly newsletter. So sign up with the link down below at theteslaspace.com. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who are listed on the screen now. You help us make the best content we can, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.